Hi, everybody. This is Pastor Pete Irig of Island Community Church. Welcome to another one of our Island Connect series. This is part 10 of the life of Paul, which is uh, the epistle to the Ephesians. Uh, excuse the hat, but I'm starting to look like Albert Einstein with a month and a half not having a haircut, so I'm sure you understand. Um, what we uh, are doing with these Island Connect series is really giving people tools to use uh, to get better in their scripture interpreting. Everybody can get better. What I'm trying to do is give you context, tools, background on various aspects of scripture to give you more to, to use when you're doing your Bible studies and your group studies and life groups and, and so on and so forth. And obviously Paul is a huge part of that and regardless of what you're studying. And so the goal is here in these series is to give you the context of Paul's life and work and the background to the letters rather than giving you an exegesis um, verse by verse of, of the letters. Um, so this is really trying to give you the background. So a recap of Paul so far. We said that he was born in Tarsus, a city in Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey in about 5 BC. His father was a Roman citizen, which was a big deal. Um, and that made Paul an automatic Roman citizen at a time when most people in the Roman provinces weren't citizens. So Paul had uh, rights uh, as a Roman citizen that most people in the provinces didn't have. He was educated in Jerusalem uh, as a young man as a Pharisee. That gave him a lot of credibility with, with Jews. Uh, he was uh, trained by the ultra-Orthodox. He persecuted Christians as a Pharisee, and of course then he had his conversion experience on the road to Damascus when he encountered the risen Christ. He took uh, three long missionary journeys throughout the Roman Empire as the apostle to the Gentiles. So he brought the, the gospel to many, many different places within the Roman Empire. Ultimately, he was uh, arrested in Judea and was under house arrest there for two years. Uh, he claimed right as a Roman citizen for a trial in Rome. They shipped him to Rome. He was in uh, house arrest and prison in Rome for a while, and then we think he was executed in 66 AD in the first persecution of the uh, Christians by the Emperor Nero. Now, as we've gone through the background for each of the letters that we've, we've looked at, um, I, I like to think about it as every one of those letters gives you a different aspect of Paul's personality that comes out. And in, so the way I look at it is when we looked at Romans, Romans gives you the contemplative Paul. It's a very in-depth, uh, measured um, uh, explanation of the gospel. Uh, it takes his time, it's very explains a lot, and that's the really the contemplative Paul. He was Roman, writing to a, a church that wasn't his church. He had never been to Rome, so he really wanted them to understand where he was coming from before he visited. First and Second Corinthians, to me, is the pastor Paul. So it's the, the church in Corinth was one that he started, and he know, knew these people well. He considered himself the, the senior pastor of that church. And so he's hearing that the Corinthians are dealing with divisions in the church and a whole bunch of other issues. And so Paul puts on his pastor hat and is really giving them some pastoral guidance of how to be a, a, a good church and good Christians to each other. Galatians is Paul the stern father or Paul with his hair on fire. It's Paul as crisis manager. Uh, the church in Galatia is also a church he started, and he was hearing that you know people were coming behind him saying, oh, well, Paul missed this part. You really need to become an Orthodox Jew to follow Christ, so you got to get circumcised. You have to follow kosher and all these other rules. And Paul heard that, and he just fired off this you know letter on fire to say, hey, what are you guys doing? Stop. Remember what I told you. Or remember what I taught, taught you. Uh, Philemon is a letter uh, that is a very short letter, and it's a very personal letter. So it's Paul as friend and coworker. He's writing to uh, somebody that he had converted, and he's a friend of his, Philemon. Uh, and uh, he's writing to uh, ask Philemon to take back Onesimus, which is a run his runaway slave, who had, Paul had subsequently converted to Christianity. Uh, Colossians that we looked at last week is uh, Paul as guard against worldly doctrines and false teaching. Uh, again, uh, he's he's telling the the church in Colossae, you know, be careful. You know, I hear that you know there are people talking about mystery things and secret knowledge and philosophical knowledge that is twisting the gospel. Remember what what the gospel is. 
This week, we're going to look at Ephesians, the letter to the Ephesians. And this is, I would say, Paul is the patient teacher. Again, it, it, it lays out what the gospel is, especially what it means to be in Christ and, and the work of Christ and how that affects you and then how you should uh, treat each other. And it really lays it out as a, as a patient teacher. Yeah, it's, it's a very wonderful in-depth study on, on what all that means. And we'll, we'll go through the background now of Ephesians. Uh, the... The city of Ephesus, and we've been looking at that map of, of Asia Minor for a while now through you know, some of the letters we've looked at. You can see that Ephesus is right there on the coast in Asia Minor, which is now, of course, Turkey. On the right is what it looks like today. It's got some of the best uh, Roman era room, ruins around. Uh, I and my family have visited there a couple of years ago. It was really an incredible experience. You can see the all, some of the temples and buildings are all are kind of standing. You can go to the marketplace, you can go down the main street. Uh, and these are the cobblestones that the Apostle Paul walked over. And so it's really a, an incredible experience. But in Paul's day, it was one of the major, it was the major city in Asia Minor. It was on the coast. Today it's uh, inland because the, the river silted up over the course of 2000 years. But in Paul's time, it was right on the coast uh, on an on a inlet, and it was a major, the major port in and out of uh, Asia Minor. So it was, a, it was a pretty big deal as a city. And you can see off to the bottom left, that's an artist's recreation of what uh, it would have looked like in Paul's time with lots of buildings and libraries, public squares, temples. The one on the lower right here is a reconstruction of the Temple of Artemis, which was famous throughout the Roman world as being an incredibly big temple and and beautiful one and a, a hugely important one dedicated to, to the goddess Artemis. And people would come from all around the Roman Empire to make a pilgrimage to this temple. And uh, that does actually play a part in uh, in scripture and in, as we'll see in, in Paul's ministry. So Paul in Ephesus, Paul visited uh, Ephesus for the first time in his first, on his first missionary journey in 52 AD uh, for about three months. And so if you look in Acts 19.1, uh, there's written there, Luke writes, when Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. So he was there for about three months, started preaching the gospel as he usually did at the synagogue first and was having great success. And of course, that success grew trouble because the Temple of Artemis also had kind of a, a pilgrimage tourist uh, industry around it. Uh, they would make all these little silver Artemis idols that people would buy in the, in the marketplace and then go up to the temple and, and dedicate it as an offering in the temple. That created a lot of income for people and there were a lot of silversmiths in Ephesus that were just making these trinkets for all the, the visiting pilgrims and tourists. And so in Acts, uh, at one point, and Acts tells us in Acts 19, that one of the silversmiths started kind of ranting and raving because Paul was converting these people to Christianity and they were stopping to go to the temple and and he was afraid that the whole city would would do that. And so he, he had he whipped up the crowd and so in Acts, it writes, when they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Soon the whole city was in an uproar. So Paul basically calls a riot in Ephesus. He left Ephesus, but the next year he went back to Ephesus and stayed there for three years. So, you know, the church in Ephesus is really one of his churches. Uh, on, and one more time, on the last journey to Jerusalem, he was going back and uh, he stopped at a, uh, a town on the coast of Asia Minor called Miletus, and he summoned the Ephesian elders from the church to Miletus to get together for a farewell message. And that's also uh, laid out in Acts as well. So Paul and Ephesus, uh, that's a big relationship. Paul started the church in Ephesus, you know, watered it, lived there for three years. So Ephesus obviously had a, a, a good place in his heart. So the occasion or the background to the letter of Ephesus, uh, to the letter to the Ephesians. 
there, as I told you before, a couple lessons ago, when we look at uh, Paul's epistles uh, or letters, there's a number of them like Romans and Corinthians, Galatians, uh, Thessalonians, that um, all Bible scholars, all evangelical Bible scholars today completely agree 100% this is written by Paul and nobody else but Paul. There was no editor. There was no... Um, you know, assistant that was taking some of his uh, ideas or his outline and then fleshing it out. Uh, Ephesians is one of those letters where there's some debate on that. And there's, I just wanted to point out why would an evangelical scholar today even doubt whether Paul wrote this or not himself. Now that doesn't mean that it's not inspired, that it's not part of scripture. It is inspired. Um, but we, we just don't have all the, uh, all the evidence, but there are some things within the text that make some people give some people for pause. And I just wanted to point those out just to let you know what they look at. So if Ephesians 1 15, uh, Paul writes in here, for this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. So scholars, some scholars will say, wait a minute, ever since I heard about your faith, you lived there for three years. You're the one that started that church. How, what do you mean I heard about your faith? So there's some, some ambiguity there. I was like, why would he say that? Uh, in Ephesians 3, 2, uh, he writes, surely you've heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. And again, this is like, surely you've heard about of course you've heard about it. I was there for three years. Why would he say that? Um, so the last part of that would be that there's uh, lots of what's called the hopex legamena in the letter of Ephesians. And that's a fancy, it's, it's basically Greek for said once. So these are words, Greek words that are not found anywhere else in all of the scriptures. And there's, there's some in every letter and every, every writing um, but there are more of them in Ephesians than anywhere else. And um, there, so the vocabulary that is used in Ephesians, there is a lot more different words in there than you find in Romans or Galatians or whatever. Now, it's not impossible um, that the same person can write different letters and use different words. I mean, we do it today for different reasons. So I think all those for, in my book, Paul wrote this letter, whether he, he wrote it you know, and dictated every word or he he dictated most of it, and his secretary put some stuff around the edges. It is inspired scripture. It is is uh, is God inspired. Um, and I, for my for my part, I think Paul wrote it. Um, now, it was probably a circular letter, and we talked about this before. A circular letter means it wasn't meant for just one church. It might be addressed to that church first but it's meant them to be passed around the area to other churches. So it was probably a circular letter meant for the Ephesian church and the churches around that area in Asia Minor. It'd be like you writing to a church in Manhattan in New York City, but knowing that that letter was going to be passed around churches in New Jersey and Connecticut and New York State. Um, the, the difficulty with Ephesians when you're trying to do this background is that as opposed to say like a Galatians where you know what the issue is, right? You know, Paul's up front, like I'm hearing this, what are you doing? You know why he fired off this letter. Um, there's not an apparent single uh, occasion that's apparent in the text that says, this is why he wrote this to Ephesus at this point. Um, it's much comes across much more like a thoughtful teaching of the doctrine of Christ and how to live the Christian life. So it's much more around, Hey, just wanted to check in and I want to reemphasize some of these things. Um, that being aside, I do think, and some other scholars think that there is a major theme behind the scene. And he talks a lot about it in Ephesians about leaving your old life behind. And now that you're walking with Christ, how do you do that? You know, is that a problem? Uh, so in the subtext of Ephesians, uh, I believe that there is, um, he knows that there, these are early Christians. These are the first generation Christians. There's no New Testament yet. There's, there might be a letter or two from Paul or Peter or somebody else that they, they keep in their home church. They have the Old Testament and they have whatever Paul or Peter or anybody told them in particular what they can remember. And so they're, they're trying to walk the Christian walk. And, but yet they're still living in the old world. 
right? They were all pagans or they're all Jews living in Ephesus, a big bustling city. And so the new Christians could have some stuff overhanging them that still affect them, right? So even though that they've come to Christ, they could still have some residual fear of pagan evil spirits or curses, or I don't want to cross that God. And I know that's probably not real, but you know, I feel iffy about it. Um, he, they're still living out in, in a city and with neighbors who are saying magical prayers and amulets and they're doing astrology. And every time they walk into somebody's house, there's a little niche in the hallway that has the little household idol that's supposed to bring good luck to the house. And so every time they turn around, they're still smacking their face of their old life. You know, I was a pagan and now I'm still living in this pagan world. And of course, there's always that leftover division between Gentiles and Jews. You know, oh, I was a Gentile and I was a Jew before I came to Christ. And now I'm a Jewish Christian or I'm a Gentile Christian. So there's always some of that overhang. Paul knows that. So even though it doesn't really pop out of this letter, I still think that this is a subcontext, just like in Corinthians, just like in Romans, just like in Galatians, of, of how do you be in Christ in still a broken world? You're living every day, you're getting up every day, and you're, you're living in a pagan world. How do you not let that affect you? How do you not let that affect your walk with Christ and your, your growth in Christ? And I, so I think that's, a, that's one of the things I really wanted to key on for the background theme of this letter. Obviously, there's tons of stuff in Ephesians, some incredible teaching, you know, God-inspired teaching. So, But I'm not going to go verse by verse. That, that's what your Bible studies are for. I'm trying to give you the background. So, so the, the area I want to touch on, which really dovetails very well, of course, with uh, the series that Pastor Trevor has been doing for a couple, you know, a number of weeks now called The Battlefield. That's his Sunday sermons. And that battlefield really revolves around that passage in, in Ephesians about putting on the armor of God. And, and Pastor Trevor's breaking that down piece by piece. What does that mean? And why do you have to have the armor of God? And, and what is it there for? And, um, so I think Ephesians really kind of brings you down that journey, obviously, with the armor of God, but, but it really talks about your Christian life and what it means to be in Christ and what Christ has done for us. So the first step, if you will, in, in this fallen world, we're all dead you know, through our sins, through this fallen world, and we become justified, right? That, and what justification is uh, as Christians it's an instantaneous occurrence when one is declared justified or righteous. One is restored to a state of righteousness in God's eyes. Like that. Well, how does that happen? Well, you are justified through faith in Jesus Christ. As it says in Ephesians 1.13, it says, And you were also included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. So. That justification happens through your faith in Jesus Christ, that Jesus was who he said he was. He was God in the flesh. He was uh, crucified. He, he poured out his blood for our sins. Through his blood, our sins were forgiven. And through his resurrection three days later, he broke the, the curse of death. And he has promised eternal life to all who believe in him. That's the gospel, right? And that's how we are justified through faith. Not by doing anything, but by believing that Jesus is who he said he was. Now, what happens there is that, that there's a regeneration that takes place. So all of a sudden, you become what you were made to be. You are now this, a son or daughter of God. Before you were dead in your trespasses, now you are a son or daughter of God. You were what, what God made you to be. You can stand up and say, I'm a son of God. And you become this new man or this new woman, this new creation. What you were, your old self is dead. You are something new now. Okay? And, and Paul talks a lot about that through all his letters. And so people then ask about, well, you know, what about good works? You have to do a lot of good works before you get to the point you can get justified. So you can either approach God and say, hey, would you justify me as, as, as your son or your daughter? No. You know, I mean, you were made for good works. And Paul says that you were made for good works. But the good works that you were made for 
flow out of our new life in Jesus Christ. I mean, though the reason you can do good works is because of God. And the reason that they flow out of you as what Paul would say, the fruit of the spirit is because we are a new creation in Jesus Christ. We are in Christ. And so those good works are just an outpouring of the fact that you are now a son or daughter of God in Christ, and you are in Christ and the Holy Spirit is in you. Uh, you cannot lose the salvation. We teach that and we believe that. So once you're justified, you're justified for, for all time. Um, so then it comes to the point, and, and this is what Trevor has been um, teaching on, and this is what Paul's talking about in Ephesians. Like, okay, so, so why is it hard sometimes for new believers or even mature believers to walk in Christ sometimes? You know, sometimes you feel like, you know, this should be so much easier or, why do I still feel like that sometimes? Or why did I react like that? Or, you know, why do I still have once in a while that sin that pops up? I thought I was the new creation and that's dead. Well, you know, our old, the old self, the old man, the old woman habits and thoughts sometimes need breaking, right? They, they lurk around in there uh, and they pop up every once in a while. Um, there's certainly the evil one. Um, the devil, uh, who would love to make you stop walking and not do those good works and not shine like a light on a hill. And, and really, you know, his, his biggest, uh, his biggest weapon is not the big, you know, big thing. It's the little itty bitty voice in the back of your head saying, you're not that good. Yeah. You're not justified. You're not, you think you're a son or daughter of God. You're not, I know who you are. You're not that good. And so it's that little you know, those lies in the back of your head that he constantly talks about and, and the world tries to give you. you. And we live in an unbelieving world. How different it isn't th than pagan Ephesus. I mean, it, it's certainly different in lots of ways, but in some ways the struggle is still the same. Every day you have to walk up and walk out into the mission field where there's lots of brokenness. There's lots of unbelieving. There's false teachings, you know, there's false teachers, just like you saw in Colossians, right? You know, there's, there's, there's stuff out there that people will lead people astray. And then there's just normal human broken world, fear, anxiety, anger, pride. You know, those things are not uh, with the power of God. Those things become less and less and we'll put them to bed, but they're still there. And you have to fight against that every day. Well, how do you do that? You do that with God and the Holy Spirit. Now, Paul recognizes this difficulty in his letter to Ephesians and also in Corinthians and Galatians and Colossians. It's, it's a theme of his because he knows that these are baby Christians. These are new in their walk and they're still going through their Christian journey. And, and he's encouraging them. He's teaching them. He's reminding them of what power God has given you to overcome this and that you are no longer that old creation. You're a new creation. You're something new now. And you, you have to remember, remember that. So that brings you to what we call sanctification and Trevor uh, touched on this on Sunday. I'm sure he'll do more. Uh, sanctification is the continuing work of God in the life of believers, making them actually holy and holier. All right. So, once you're justified, you're regenerated, then you spend the rest of your life being sanctified by, by God. So bit by bit, inch by inch, God aligns your moral condition in line with your new legal status, that you are now a son or daughter of God. You are justified in God's eyes. And now through the power of the Holy Spirit, because sanctification is done by the Holy Spirit inside of you, you become slowly, slowly more and more what God is exactly intending you to be. Now, sometimes it's going to feel like, you know, two steps forward, three steps back. And so God doesn't promise you and Christ doesn't promise you that every day you're going to be, you know, come up and you're going to be twice as good tomorrow as you will today. What it gives you, what Christ gives you is the power to get up every day and say, I didn't do that well yesterday, but I'm going to go up and do it again because I've got Christ in me. I've got, I've got the Holy Spirit helping me. And even if it takes the rest of my life and the rest up until the resurrection, I will get there. I will be perfect um, as Christ has promised me. Well, probably not in this life, but 
obviously at the resurrection it will, but God will continuously work on you and there will be nothing that you can't recover from over and over again if you have to. Once you're justified, you're justified. And so Paul um, gives a, kind of a picture of this in Ephesians 5.25. And he's talking about how husbands and wives and, and people should relate to each other. So he's got some advice for husbands. He says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. This picture is, is Christ through his work and through who he is and him being God and the Holy Spirit that he has sent to, to help us is at some point, it's Christ that does the work. It's the Holy Spirit does the work till at such a point we will be made perfect. And we will be standing in front of the throne and perfect. And that will be the work of Christ. And, and there's nothing that can stop that. And it's going to feel fits and starts. You feel, oh, I'm not making enough progress. You will. If not in this life, certainly as a resurrection. So it's a lifelong process until what is called we get glorified in the resurrection. You will be made perfect. And with a resurrection body and to, to live forever in the presence of God. So, you know, Paul gives a very practical, very powerful uh, image of how do you, how do you as a Christian, as this baby Christian, walk through this pagan world, with all these things gnawing at you, but yet you have this new life, this new identity. How, how do you, how do you kind of gird yourself every day to, well, you put on the armor of God. And, and Trevor has done a, a wonderful job of, of really espousing on that, you know, the belt of truth and the breastplate and the sword and the helmet. God has given you himself, all right? He's given you his son, Jesus Christ. You have the Holy Spirit that dwells within you because you are justified. You're a daughter and son of God now. And so put on that armor of God every day, every day. It's available every day, and it's required, because without God's help, you couldn't do it. But with God's help, nothing can stop you. Okay, So that's why that, that armor of God is so important as, as an illustration and as a practical tool. I mean, it's there for, for us. So um, I think that's a, a big context of Ephesians. Uh, in general, the, what I would say the importance of the, the epistle to the Ephesians is it's, it's inspired, patient teaching on what it means to be in Christ. If you, if you read, the, there are some incredible teachings, incredible biblical truths about what Christ has done for us and how we participate in that and how we're really in Christ. And so then it addresses, you know, how do you resist the distractions, the worries, the temptations of this fallen world? I mean, it gives you practical uh, and theological um, teaching on that. Explains this power of the armor of God. What a, what a wonderful um, picture it paints of what's available to you as a follower of Christ to wake up every day and, and continue with the, the work of sanctification of the Holy Spirit. and. Also, it gives really good practical, uh, theological and practical advice on how Christians should relate to each other, wives and husbands, the church, Jews and Gentiles, or different types of Christians. So, again, it's, it's incredibly great, patient teaching uh, on all of these things. And I think that's one of the, the importance of the letter of, of uh, the Ephesians. So, as a recap, we've talked about Paul, obviously, quite a bit. Uh, he's wrote a large, large part of the New Testament, the most important theologian in the church. He was the apostle, apostle to the Gentiles, uh, had to deal with Judaizers and faith false teachers at every turn. Uh, he had to write to all these early churches that he started and continuously help them. And we, and we obviously have that as the basis in the New Testament. And his epistles, his letters are foundational for Christian theology. So all roads, whatever study you're doing, eventually run through Paul because he is just an incredible, uh, gifted, inspired teacher of 
what it means to be in Christ. What did Christ do for us? Obviously, the Gospels, you, you combine Paul with the Gospels and Acts and all the other scripture. It's just, it's just an endless well of inspiration and, and guidance on what it means to live as, as a son or daughter of God. So I hopefully this was, uh, was good for you all. I'll, I'll try to do another uh, recording next week. Probably, um, I'll probably do uh, Thessalonians, but uh, I hope everyone's safe. I hope everyone is uh, using this time, uh, this little bit in between Netflix and whatever else you're doing, uh, be in the word. You know, it's helpful. Use this time as reflection more now than ever. Try to reach out to each other, uh, even if it's virtually, and, and, and you know, share the love of Christ with each other and with your neighbor. Until then, I'll see you next week. Thank you.